Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Maria Tranquilli, and I'm a program manager at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. For those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and grow. We will open up for live Q&A at the end of this event, so please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. And none of what we do could be possible without all of the amazing support from our sponsors. We are humbled by their contributions. During these unique times, we are curious about sentiment, how you are feeling as entrepreneurs within our community. We would like to start by taking two different polls that let us know how you are feeling. Launching poll number one, how are you feeling at this moment? Are you feeling fearful, anxious? Do you feel like you're surviving or are you feeling optimistic? Please let us know. Wonderful, so I'll share that poll. We have a lot of optimism in the room right now and some anxiousness and some people feel like they're surviving. So hopefully this amazing author in residence will help soothe some of that. And our next poll, what is keeping you up at night? Is it finance, sales, marketing? Is it scaling, pivoting, your team or surviving? We would love to know. Wonderful, thank you all. It looks like sales with a close marketing coming in second. Thank you all for contributing there, so interesting. All right, well, without further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our special guest, Victoria Montgomery Brown, author of Digital Goddess, The Unfiltered Lessons of a Female Entrepreneur, and CEO and co-founder of Big Think. Victoria, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, it's great to be here. Oh, absolutely. I know we have an audience that's very excited to hear from you. Well, let's dive right in. We have so many questions for you. And please, everyone that is here, we would love for you to submit your questions in the Q&A function and or the chat. We can make sure we weave those into the conversation we have with Victoria today so they are answered live. Victoria has so much wisdom and knowledge. It is absolutely incredible that she's with us today. So Victoria, to jump on in, can you tell us something that's true that almost no one agrees with you on? We would love to know. Sure, well, something that is true for me at any rate that I think a lot of people might disagree with me on is that at least at this moment in time, I think being a woman starting a business, it's probably much easier than it would be for a man. And I know that's controversial, but that's what I think Oh, that is so interesting. Oh my goodness. Well, I would love to hear, can you tell us about a little bit about that? Can you tell us about how the playing field might be off balance and in what ways that is the case? And how can women founders or founders in general create unstoppable velocity in their company right now, considering how the playing field might be in balance or not? Absolutely. So when we started Big Think 13 years ago, I think it was a totally different playing field because there were far fewer women entrepreneurs and the sort of at the moment type thinking was the Mark Zuckerbergs of the, of the world were the type of individuals who should get funding, like the, the tech guys wearing hoodies and things and somebody like myself who came from a different background, I think was somewhat, you know, it, not the norm. And so getting meetings was probably initially much harder. Now, women in business are much more prevalent. Women entrepreneurs are much more prevalent. And there are loads of case studies of women who have been successful in their businesses, like Sarah Blakely, the founder of Spanx, and, and many, many others. And I think that the playing field has changed in the last decade in that men really want to help women entrepreneurs. Um, there are studies that show that women entrepreneurs are often more successful than men. I can't remember the exact statistics, but they are. And it's great to have the diversity in businesses around. And so for me, at any case, um, at this moment, I think if I were to start a business today, it would be easier than a male counterpart. Um, and the second part of your question, I think, of how can women make their businesses as robust? That wasn't the exact language you used, but 
something like that as possible. And I think there's no difference for men or women. It's just about having a fantastic idea or product and scaling it. Um, interestingly enough in the poll, th those are one of the things that I would have been worried about is scaling the business. But basically being an entrepreneur for everybody is challenging and faces the same um, issues. And you just have to have an amazing product. Oh, I love that. Well, speaking of an amazing product, big thank your leading digital media knowledge company. I know it was a scrappy, creative labor of love that was born in New York City. And I'm wondering, I mean, I know we know it had to fight for its existence most of the time. So what do you wish you would have known 13 years ago when you started Big Think? We would love to know. Well, technology has obviously changed massively in 13 years, but what I wish I would have known back then was that things would be changing and that interviews eventually would be done via this format. When we started Big Think, we had kind of a notion that we would be interviewing our experts a little bit like this and invested a large portion of the early money we raised in the technology background. And I think that that was wasted. And so had I known that we, wouldn't, we weren't going to use it or that we didn't need it. I think that those resources could have been put to much better use, including hiring more people and investing in marketing and sales. So probably a third of the money we raised went to building our website, which was not a good use of our resources then. Oh, that is so interesting. I think we need to ask a little bit more about how you used your resources and what lessons you may have learned a little bit later on. I know that that would help a lot of entrepreneurs on the call. Yeah, absolutely. So when we first raised money in 2007, when we, the, the money finally hit the big think bank account, we were afraid to spend any of it. The first two purchases I remember we bought were the then much earlier version of uh, a MacBook for Peter and for me. And every time we spent a little bit of money, there was a feeling of anxiety. Um, but the, the, we knew we needed a website because we were building a media company focused on the internet. And so the next amount of money that we spent was finding a web development team. And that I think was not money well spent because we actually should have hired people internally. The external teams are often very good or providers, but they don't have your best interest at heart because it's, you know, a consulting agreement essentially. And so, I wish we had spent money um, initially on investing in our own technology versus outsourcing it to others and also bringing on more, more people quickly. We were quite hesitant to hire at the start because we felt we had to get every person in position exactly right. And I think we could have scaled a little more quickly if we had hired more people in a in much more rapid fire way. Um, and then the rest of the money, I mean, we, we we're very cautious about spending money in the early days, but it was mostly on things like office space, people, technology, and then back then production equipment because we were filming um, people. And so production equipment, cameras, and things like that were much, much, much more expensive back then. This is fantastic to hear the breakdown of, of your thought process and how, it, it, I know for early stage founders, spending that money is a really are really hard decisions to make where to do that when and and how will investors support you so really phenomenal wisdom victoria thank you so much for sharing this and i think you know what i'm hearing is that the arc of your leadership style may have evolved over time from the early stages throughout can you speak to that a little bit how that change happened absolutely so i had actually in hindsight never had a woman boss before um and I had this notion incorrectly that leadership was kind of a command and control type dynamic, like the military. And that I think led to initially brittle relationships with some of the people working at Big Think because I wasn't bringing my authentic self to work. I felt like showing any weakness would not be productive and would potentially make people respect me less. I found the absolute opposite to be true, that once I, showed my vulnerability and that I was not the person who had all the answers for everything. People were much more receptive to me and I think we achieved things a lot more quickly and much more pleasurably. We spent so much of our lives at work 
that not bringing your authentic self there is no fun. And it's like you're being somebody else for 12 hours a day or whatever. And so it took me, I would say a couple of years or maybe even a few years to finally change that. But once I did, I was much happier. And I think those around me were as well too. Oh, what a beautiful share. And I, I'd like to ask, we have a question from the audience. It's a short one. How did you manage to decide that change needed to happen? Was it through mentorship? How did, how did you decide that bringing vulnerability to your role was actually necessary? I think I had some difficult conversations with um, employees early on. And the way that I would deal with it was in a, in a, a harsh way. And I would feel bad after those conversations and I knew that they would feel bad after those conversations. And so it was potentially guilt <laughs> that made me uh, change the way that I was dealing with people because I wanted to feel like I was encouraging and helping people develop versus just reprimanding or demanding performance from people. And so it was something internal in me that made me realize that this was not the way to behave. And if I was advising somebody else I would advise them to have been behaving differently than, than I was. And I also, over the years, did have the opportunity to work with more women in leadership roles. And I saw the ones that I most respected, and I think were probably the most effective, were the ones who were soft and, and vulnerable. Now, did they have to be stern at some times? For sure. But they were their best and authentic selves at, at work. Oh, that's fantastic to hear the growth and the trajectory during your time as a leader at your company. So helpful. So welcome everyone. I want to thank the few people that have joined us in the last few minutes. We're so happy that you're with us. Please submit any questions that you have in the Q&A function and or in the chat. We would love to ask those questions to Victoria. And also we have the possibility if you were to raise your hand, we could actually have you share your voice and ask your question live if you feel brave today. We would love to take you. Um, so, Victoria, are you ready for one or two more questions here? We have so many. Absolutely. Wonderful. So, do you have a process that you could share with this group for making some hard decisions? And another way to ask this question could be, what is one of the hardest choices that you've made as a founder and what was your process for making that decision? Well, this is an example of one that I should have acted much more swiftly. So, this is probably an example of what not to do, which may be much more helpful than one, a decision that I made that I think I made swiftly and, and well. So in the book, there's a chapter that I write about my business partner, Peter Hopkins and myself, which is a fundamental relationship, professional relationship of my life and big thing would not exist without Peter. And roles change along the way, and there are ups and downs in, in business relationships, just as there are in personal relationships. And Peter is very open about this, but a few years in, maybe five or six years into Big Think, and we've been around for 13 years now, Peter became addicted to drugs. And I could see it, people in the office could see it, but I buried my head in the sand and chose to avoid it because I didn't want to harm him and I also felt like it was an admitting weakness on both of our parts to address it and that served him no no good and it didn't serve the business any good either and so things came to a head essentially when the staff said you know you've got to be blind if you're not seeing what's going on here going on here and we won't work um, with Peter in this capacity anymore until he addresses the situation. And so we, for a short amount of time, Peter went and you know, was excised from the business. He was still president, but he went and took care of his issues. And that was a really difficult decision for me because I, for a short amount of time, didn't have a business partner on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and at the, I was also, I think, ashamed that I hadn't addressed it much earlier, which would have been better for, for everybody all around. Um, but that was an example of things literally having to be in my face and blowing up before I addressed it. So I knew well, well before he um, admitted it or the staff came to me that there was something major and bad going on with him. And I should have addressed it with him 
months earlier. Um, so that's just an example, I think, of, of ways that my decision making was not sound in certain points. Victoria, these shares are so honest and incredible and raw, I, I feel as though, and so much of your book also explains some of these stories further, which I think um, really, really helps founders understand the depth of decision making and the depth of wisdom that you had to bring to making some of these decisions. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, it sounds like honesty was such a big part in the decision making process that that you had to face. So I wanted to know, can you speak a little bit about how honesty played a part and how maybe you've become more brazen as the years have gone on? Yeah, so very early on in Big Think, and it's in the first chapter, right before we were set to launch, the New York Times was going to um, have an article about us, um, and it was in January of 2008. And we had spent the prior six months building, creating content, et cetera, but, but our website hadn't launched yet. So this was a big deal for us. And a notable investor was going to be part of the article. And I was at Union Square in New York, coming out of the subway sometime in the autumn of, two, that late autumn of 2007. And I received a call on my phone and typically I don't pick up unknown, answer, or unknown cell calls, but something told me to pick it up. And I did, and there was a very heavy New York accent on the other end of the line. And it turned out that it was a detective from the NYPD who was asking me, not asking me, telling me, to come to um, a precinct in New York that I had wronged you know, a powerful man. And me being naive, I guess, never having been in a situation like that before, just was like, yes, sir. And I jumped into a car and I called at that moment my then fiance, who was a lawyer and a banker. And he said, what are you doing? You have no idea what this is about. Get out of the car. But being just so eager to please and worried I was in trouble, I went to the, to the precinct and there was a detective waiting there. In any case, I had taken car service from the previous place that I was listening and the, the my former employer was not happy about it, but he was also mostly not happy that I had left to go and start my own business. So a whole host of events was put into play and I was charged and arrested. Um, none of this came to pass, thank God. All of it was expunged. But at that moment, I had a decision to make. I could have buried it under the carpet and said nothing and probably nothing would have happened because everything was expunged um, months later. But I decided that at this point, honesty was the only policy and that transparency is at all costs was a must. So these investors who I really didn't know very well, five incredible people, had just recently put their money behind Peter and me, primarily because of who we were and the ideas we presented. So I thought these people have invested in me and now is the time to show them who I really am at the worst possible moment. So rather than burying it under the carpet, I called three of the investors, our lead investor, David Frankel, and two others, and Peter called the other two investors and told them exactly what had happened. Now, I had no idea if they would stand by and support, if they would demand their money back or whatever. They all thought that it was ridiculous and much to my surprise and delight, my relationships with them because of that event were actually made much stronger. And so to me, there's nothing that um, an entrepreneur to, is more important for an entrepreneur than transparency with your clients, with your employees, and most importantly, with your investors. And in the last few years, as, as probably most people know, a, a raging example of not doing that has come to pass with Elizabeth Holmes. And look at her now. She's facing major criminal charges um, and has ruined her life and the lives of others and her investors were overwhelmed by her. They thought that what she was presenting was so incredible, it turned out not to be true. And because she didn't want to admit to that, she destroyed her life and her company and the, the, the lives of many of the employees who worked for her as well as her business. So that's the kind of flip side example. Victoria, again, so much wisdom in what you were sharing, the stories that you were sharing. I know that entrepreneurs, founders, and others in this audience are absolutely learning and reflecting from the lessons that you are sharing. Thank you so much for 
even step by step through these stories, speaking about your own experience and how you actually went to funders to share what the next steps could be or really letting them know what was happening. Um, a follow up question, which you've you've answered, though, I think maybe if possible, getting a little bit more specific. How were you able to navigate the, if there was negative press or PR? How did you navigate that? I know you mentioned reaching out to funders, but whether, were there other ways? I think some founders might be interested in knowing what your process was there. I don't know that I necessarily have a process. The way that I think about it is for any bad press or bad news you may have to deliver, to get out ahead of it and deliver it in as bleak terms as possible. Because your integrity and you know people, the confidence and belief people have in you can be destroyed in an instant if you exaggerate, embellish, or don't fess up to something that is going really badly. Whether you haven't hit your sales numbers or something, I say get out in front of it and tell it worse than it is because that will make people trust you and believe in you far more than if you're afraid to give the harsh news. Um, and while it's really unpleasant in the moment to deliver that news, over the long haul, and it may have bad implications in the moment as well, but over the long run, I think it's far more valuable to do that than to try and present a more rosy story. Priceless, priceless advice. Thank you so much, Victoria. And thank you all so much again for joining us. We are so excited about having Victoria with us today. She is answering some incredible questions. Please submit your questions in the Q&A and or the chat. And I know some people have asked whether this is being recorded so they can rewatch it, absolutely. So you will have in a follow-up email that we will send you uh, a recording of this so you can listen to Victoria's wisdom again. So Victoria, talking about disruption and actually this question is around where we are currently. Companies in every industry are transforming how they navigate the disruptors brought on by our current situation, our current pandemic. And in your book, you identify ways to transform, transform a company toward the future. Why do leaders of all organizations from startups to mature businesses need to think differently as we head into 2021? Well, I can only speak to our own business but our business has been totally disrupted. You know, we, we had a studio in New York City where we brought people in, and that was what made Big Think different. We had these incredible experts, Nobel laureates, leading actors, etc. And we would have a highly produced interviews within our organization um, on a daily basis. That obviously all changed in March, and we had to think to ourselves, okay, how are we going to continue with our business? And like everybody, we turned to Zoom and other platforms, and it, instead of actually being bad for Big Think, we embraced this change, and we've been creating much more video content because it's far easier for people to be interviewed in situations like this than having to go on location. So while initially it seemed like a big problem for us, embracing change and learning how to apply it to possible um, advancement or growth is something that I would advise uh, people to do and not immediately think of it as a, as a disaster. Um, so I don't know that that really answered your question, but that's what we did in any case. Absolutely, it answered the question. Really thinking forward into 2021, knowing we need to be agile. It sounds very clear that you were really agile in March, and I'm sure actually founders and entrepreneurs in this audience have had to do the same thing in shifting. And if any of you have questions to ask Victoria about that specifically, please let us know. Uh, Victoria, a follow-up question to that. How do you believe women entrepreneurs specifically are uniquely positioned to weather uncertainty? Um, I don't know that anybody is uniquely positioned to do it. Um, I will say that I think that I can only speak for myself, but I think one of the um, traits that a lot of women have is vulnerability that can be used to an advantage. And so weathering difficult times, for me, I think it's far more easy um, to ask for help and guidance in those times than it might be for my business partner because men are often think that themselves that they need to be strong and have a hard shell and know the answers to everything. I think for women, Showing your vulnerability is seen 
I think sometimes is a positive. And for me, it's allowed me to ask for help when others, men might not have been able to do so or not felt like they could do so. That is great, great reflection, Victoria. And I know a lot of people in the audience are actually trying to understand where where we might go economically, uh, whether globally or nationally. So your words of advice and wisdom are very inspirational. And we're, we're seeing here um, some chat. That's a great point. And thank you so much. This is very inspiring. So thank you all so much for sharing those. And make sure when you, when you are in chat to click the blue button so that everyone can see uh, exactly what you're typing. We love when the community is sharing. Um, so let's see, Victoria, let's move into um, competition and how to differentiate. We actually had quite a few questions about this. So in a world of global competition, how do you best differentiate and maintain the distinction of your company? Well, our product has changed over the years. I think something that is, is critical is to not be wed to what you are currently doing and to be forward looking. So Clayton Christensen, who was a professor at Harvard Business School and, and widely considered kind of the guru of innovation and disruption, wrote in his book, one of his many books, about um, the steamship when that disrupted uh, basically on the waterways delivery of goods and cargo and people and shipping boats that were under sail, um, rather than thinking, okay, this is a total transformation and disruption and we better rethink the way that we're providing our services. They just decided that in addition to the sale, they would put um, the mechanics of the steamship on their boats as well. So rather than embracing it, they had one foot in the back, uh, backwards and one foot forwards, realize, instead of embracing the fact that the industry would never be the same again. Um, and those, type, those companies went out of business. And so in our own experience of Big Think, and I think for any company today, you must be forward looking. And what has led to your success in the past is likely not what's going to lead to your success in the future and be willing to give those things up to keep you know, uh, innovation, innovation coming. Mm, Victoria, thank you so much. And it's so interesting to think about <clears throat> how currently disruption um, or differentiation and maintaining that distinction, it actually seems as though it's inevitable considering we need to be so agile in the current circumstances. And I feel like you're hinting at that. Yeah, I do. Uh, I know agility is, is critical at, at the moment. And there's an example, this is not an example from Big Think, but a friend of mine was talking about two companies that he represented as a lawyer, I don't know the names of them, both were event companies. One was for in-person events that was booming before um, COVID hit. And he would have predicted that this company was going to go you know, to the moon. Another company that was not doing well at all was a company that was doing entirely virtual events. And I'm sure you can imagine what happened. The company who was doing the live events did not change. They just thought that things would clear up and you know, in a matter of weeks, live events would be back. Obviously, we know that that hasn't happened. That company went out of business. The company that entirely embraced the virtual events, which was not doing so well in the early and at start, is now booming. And they went for it. They saw us, you know, what is this world coming to and embraced the challenges that we were all facing and made great made hay out of it. Um, and so I don't know what the advice is there, except to just know and recognize that things are changing all the time. And if you don't demonstrate agility and be agile, the likelihood that your business will continue to thrive is pretty low. Thank you so much, Victoria. And I think you're right. We've seen that in so many cases just in the past few months. So some great examples and insight there. Thank you. Um, another question here, how can companies disrupt even as leaders in their industries and continue to break the rules when they might no longer be the challengers, but they're the leaders of those companies? Well, I'm not sure that I've had that experience yet, but again, I think it's, if you're in a large organization, hiring people who have totally different mindset than you and are probably um, a lot more inexperienced because 
they see what's going on and will see what's going on before the leaders who are entrenched in the current organization will do so. So that's what I would do in any case is make sure that I have people around me who have different experiences and probably in my case are much younger and can see around corners that I don't. There's a term, I think in, in the moment, I did not come up with this, which is reverse mentoring, where people who have been in roles of leadership are being mentored by people who are just starting their careers so that both benefit from it. And I think that that's fundamental and something that I didn't experience early on, but wish that I had. I love that reverse mentoring. Absolutely. We have some questions later, I think, about mentorship specifically, Victoria. So at this moment, though, I know that this group has questions about funding. So if you're willing, I would love to ask you, what are some of the first steps that you would suggest entrepreneurs make to obtain funding? Well, every entrepreneur has to have a kick-ass idea and have it be differentiated, researched, that whatever they're trying to build or create is differentiated, that there is a market for it, and that they are uniquely positioned to, to build the product or whatever it is they're building. So no entrepreneur can get around any of that before raising money. The other thing that I would say is that demonstrate to the best of your capacity that you're already doing what you're trying to create. So in our case, we went and got a bunch of people to agree to interviews before we had a website or anything like that. So it's jump in and go for it to demonstrate that you have what it takes. And if, these, if the people you're trying to get money from invest in you, you will do what you say and build what it is that you're trying to convince them you will build. So that's my advice is number one is make sure you have an amazing product and that it's differentiated and that you're uniquely able to do it. And number two, starts. Fantastic, Victoria. And specifically in reference to your book, it seems that the investor space is dominated by men. So how might an entrepreneur or founder deal with that and set specific boundaries if let's say they're a woman founder um, in that space? Well, I know that this is probably not PC, but I think women have a lot more power than they think to set boundaries. And I, in my 13 years of, of running Big Think and being a co-founder, have never had one experience um, with a man who was an investor or client or whatever, because I think I set very clear boundaries and made it abundantly clear that this was all about the business and nothing else. Now, perhaps women might say that I'm you know, naive and haven't experienced the bad things that they have, but I, I feel like I could have been in some of those situations and I just made it all about the business and I never put myself in situations if I were traveling with clients or whatever that there could be any miscon misconstrue or misconstruction about what we were there to achieve. So I don't know if that answered your questions, and but that's what that that's what I did in any case. That's great, Victoria. Thank you. And we actually, we have a we have a comment from Anna in the audience. Do you think, or don't you think, that men are also willing to support women businesses, whether it's your father, your friends? They seem to believe in us more and more and empower us to help us succeed. I believe that a hundred percent. I know that in the thirteen years of of running Big Think more and more men have become not only interested but impassioned advocates for women in business. And so I think now is as good a time as any for women entrepreneurs to be starting businesses. And men are some of their, I mean, I think they are their biggest champions. Love this. So we have another question um, that around boundaries. What are a couple of specific things that you did to create boundaries within those conversations that you were having? Would you be willing to share? I'm trying to think of specific examples. Um, again, I think, you know, being vulnerable in your authentic self in those conversations is something that, that women should do and not feel that that means that they're not creating boundaries, but 
not being too, I suppose, familiar or flirtatious, I think that's an easy, an easy thing not to do. Um, and the concept that if you are any of those things or behaving that way will more likely lead to money, I think it will more likely lead to not getting money because they'll, there will become a discomfort between the two of you that is difficult to overcome. Um, so I would just say that ask yourself in those moments, or I ask myself, what is the real goal here? It's to have this person invest in me and the business, not to form a friendly relationship or a romantic relationship. I am here with this person because I believe that they can help me and the business succeed. And to just keep that as a focus. And that's not specific enough advice, probably, but that's, that's how I would go about these things. Thank you so much for answering that live. And for all of you, please continue to post your questions. We would love to have Victoria answer them live. Um, Victoria, I think that was fantastic. It's, you're really referencing integrity and remaining in integrity during conversations. It's wonderful. And we have a thank you to the attendee who asked that question. So absolutely. Um, back to funding, because I know it's a very, very important issue for founders. When seeking funding or other resources, what got you there? Was mentorship a role? And we have some follow-up questions here, but we're curious about how you actually, when you were seeking funding or other resources, what got you there? Initially on, um, it was the mission. So all of our initial investors really liked that we said that the goal of Big Think is to help other individuals have access to notable thought leaders in a way that only other at that moment in time thought leaders had access to. So the mission is really critical. Um, and I think if you believe it, you can help others believe it and that will lead to, to fundraising. Um, and then, this is not a joke, but I would say desperation and fear of going out of business has also been a kick in the pants to fundraising. And I think in the moments of hard times, scrappiness, um, often really pays off and you can be most innovative in those moments. And when we desperately needed money, I think I was sometimes but to fundraise. And so I had no embarrassment. It was we're raising money or we're going out of business. And so I don't know, it's, it was fear, I think, and anxiety in those moments that drove the fundraising successfully. Thank you for being so honest. I think that is something founders, entrepreneurs face daily. And a follow-up question that we have live from the audience, when do you think a good time to ask for funding is? And considering how many years you have been doing this for the 13 years you have been, how many years in should a founder start to be asking for money and what should the profits be? What amounts should be asked for? That might be very specific, but maybe you're able to answer in broader strokes. Well, if I were starting a business again, um, the best scenario is if you don't need to fundraise at the start, uh, because if the barrier to entry is raising money, obviously it's, it's more difficult to start the business. Um, so let's say in that scenario, I think fundraising, once you have an idea off the ground, is if you identify individuals who you think are uniquely positioned to help you grow the business because of their resources and the, the background. So I would start to think about fundraising once I had the idea off the ground and identified VCs or individuals who could help me scale the business. Um, in the other scenario, which we were in, was we needed money to even forge the business. Obviously, day one is when you need to start thinking about raising the money. And then as you grow, if you need to scale the business ongoing, um, and I would also encourage people, people sometimes think that giving up a piece of their business is a losing scenario. If you're giving up a piece of your business to somebody who's going to help grow it um, hugely, that's a win, it's not a loss. And the equity you're giving up is going to be, the whole business will be far more valuable even though you as a founder and maybe your co-founders or initial employees might have less equity. You have to think long-term and what is the value that this person is, is providing, who's actually providing us with um, cash resources. Fantastic, Victoria. Thank you so much. So we actually have a follow-up question there. How did you determine which fund, I'm sorry, funders 
to approach first and what were some of the ways you approached them? So initially the lead investor in Big Think is a man named David Frankel. And I was introduced, reintroduced to him. I actually knew him at business school um, through another entrepreneur. And all of the, the first five investors were very mission driven. Now, did they hope that Big Think would scale hugely? Yes, of course they did, and that they would make boatloads of money. Um, but we approached them with the mission, uh, and that's what they that's what they liked. And so. I don't know if you're if you're building a company of widgets, money is going to be what the investors probably want to see is going to be coming back their way. But for us, we approach people with the value proposition of what they would be investing in versus just the financial reward. Uh, so that is our perspective. I think you know business different businesses have different ways that they will need to approach potential investors. Thank you so much. So please let us know, um, send me a chat if that question was answered or if you need any follow up, um, any more explicit instruction. But Victoria, that sounded fantastic. I know so many founders are always wondering, how do I approach a VC once I found them? And, and what do I actually say? So it's really fantastic to hear that you really spoke to the mission and made sure that they were mission aligned in order to move forward in the early stages. Thank you so much. All right, let's see. We have some, uh, some additional great questions here, um, actually around mentorship. So how did mentorship play a role in your leadership over the past 13 years? And, and how did that change from years one through five through 10 through 13? Well, initially I would say that the first, um, our lead investor, David Frankel, was probably the first mentor that I had. And in, away you know it was the most scary because he was also had also given us money so um he was he was a mentor but he also had something riding on it over the years uh other mentors have come to me and i will say that i never overtly asked for mentors but was open to it even though i didn't know that i was and as time marched on certain issues became apparent in the business and I would ask these people for help or guidance. And through that, they became a mentor. It wasn't that I, I actually identified a person and thought, oh, this person can be my mentor. It was through the needs of the business and conversations around it that these mentors presented themselves. And for me, that was the, the authentic way. I don't know even now if I come up with a notion in my head, well, this person would be a great mentor because I would have to have a specific reason for them to be one. So I think it's just being open to the possibility and uh, recognizing what your business needs are, what personal development needs are, and asking that person for advice. Victoria, I love that. So acting very intentionally, identifying the needs of your company first, as opposed to seeing a bright, shiny mentor and just wanting to get a meeting with them. I know that so many entrepreneurs actually are learning those steps, especially in the early stages, rather than seeking out a mentor that is this and that or in the public eye, really centering like you are mentioning the needs of the business and knowing that that mentor will be able to speak to and help assist within a specific problem area. It sounds like that's actually what you're suggesting to do. Yes, you said it a million times better than I did. <laughs> well, oh no, it came from you. <laughs> um, let's see. And then again, around mentorship, um, how does a founder really leverage the highest potential of a mentor conversation? What might you suggest? I know that you, you very much answered, um, like we just mentioned, getting really specific about the company needs, but during that conversation, knowing that mentors probably have a very short amount of time to share, how might a founder leverage a conversation the best way possible? I think, as with most conversations, you will get the best result if you're as authentic and open as possible. So if you go in posturing, um, I don't think that will lead to, to fruitful results or help from, from a mentor. So if you have a specific objective or something that you need their help with, presenting it um, as vulnerably as possible. 
because I feel like people want to help people who are struggling or in need. And if you present kind of a hard face of it, they'll be less likely. So vulnerability and authenticity and openness is I think how you will get the best results from your mentor. If they think that you're coming to them, um, kind of like a homework report where there's not, there's not a lot of emotion in it for them, I think that they will be much less interested to help. That's very well said, Victoria. Thank you so much. And I, I can say from the NASDAQ entrepreneurial standpoint, we host many mentors and this is absolutely the case. So you are spot on. Thank you so much for sharing. You. <laughs> absolutely. Well, and shifting a little bit, I know that you write that it's, poss it, that it's possible to run a startup without having a breakdown. And really this shifts to um, mental health, emotional health. We are curious, you know, how might a founder do this? How might they start a startup and not have that breakdown that everyone inevitably believes will happen? Um, well, I speak from a founder who did have a breakdown. Um, and I will say that this was another moment where Peter actually came to, to my aid years after I had to some degree come to his aid. Um, I would just say that mental health is far more important than your success as an entrepreneur. And I was deriving my entire identity on Big Think, which was really not valuable to me mentally or emotionally. Um, and so I just think taking care of yourself, I didn't. I had a breakdown, I guess it was a few years ago, when everything about my life seemed to revolve around Big Think. And so I think to not have a breakdown, had I made other things in my life equally as important, I pro that probably wouldn't have happened to me. So that's what I would advise. Make sure that you have other outlets than your business. And your friends and family are probably more important to you than, or should be more important um, long-term than building the business. Very wise advice, Victoria. Thank you so much. Um, and for everyone that is listening, again, please put your questions in the Q&A and or the chat. We have just a few more minutes with Victoria. We want to make sure that all of your questions are answered here. Um, I actually have quite a few questions listed here, Victoria, if you are ready to jump into maybe some more random and even more specific questions about your background. How does that sound to you? Sounds great. Great. Okay, let's see. So we have a question around, let's see. Could you share a little bit about your experience on the Charlie Rose Show? What were the top two challenges? Are you willing to? Oh, um, sure. The top two challenges, I think, hmm. I think because of his reputation, booking people was not such of a challenge. I would say that it was an interesting work environment. Um, so that was, I was never a part of any of the, of the, the Me Too stuff. Um, but I would say that, you know, working in an organization where one person's name is on the door is its own unique challenge. So I would just say that the work environment was probably the first and second most challenging thing for anybody who works there. Very well said. We have another question from Bud in the audience. What books or resources most helped shape your way of work and way of thinking about forming Big Think? Hmm. I don't know. I think that both Peter and I are very interested in learning um, and so just being open to, to that and reading a lot I think has, was, was particularly useful. I don't think that there's one book I will say that something that has helped me in terms of positivity, there's a book by, a lot of people will, will say that this is probably uh, a little out there, but a book by Shakti Gawain, which is uh, Creative Visualization, which is essentially believing that you can create something um, and manifesting that intention probably helped me in, in creating big thing. I don't know that Peter would agree with that, but at least it, it helped me. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and we actually have a question about co-founders. And I know you've mentioned Peter quite a few times, and it sounds like the journey that you've had together has been immense and actually really important and pivotal to your personal success and also the success of Big Think. So we have a question here from Pep in the audience. What is a backup plan for a startup or what would you suggest if you have a co-founder and they might need to walk away or they can walk away? 
you know, in the, um, they say here in the case of Peter, you know, let's say he might not have been able to resolve his problem. What was your plan B? And um, it sounds like some founders might be in a position where they do have co-founders and they want to very successfully navigate experiences similar to the one that you've had. Well, I know, I do know personally founders who have had breakups with their business partner that have been unnecessarily pleasant in my opinion, that could have been handled much better. So I didn't have a backup plan for Peter. The way that I approached it and that he approached me um, when I was having my issues is I think with the intent that you want the best for this person and the belief that they also want the best for the business. You both want the best for the business and ultimately for each other. And so having that difficult conversation with that mindset, I think things can be resolved. It's when you go in, I think, with the mindset that this person is a problem or um, there has to be something catastrophic and this person has to be pushed out. Um, I don't think that will end in, in positive results for the business or for the person. It's just entering it with the optimism and belief that the best interest of both of you is what you both have at heart and having a conversation like that, even though it has to be difficult. So much wisdom in your responses, Victoria. Thank you so much. You've lived an incredible, incredible life in these past 13 years in developing big things. So I know for a fact these entrepreneurs and founders and others listening are really gaining a lot of personal insight. Um, I yeah. so. Oh, I believe so. And let us know in the chat as well. Please, um, please let us know what you're thinking and feeling and hearing here. We would love your feedback as well. And I know actually ISIS on the NASDAQ team has also posted a survey. It takes two to three minutes and we would love, Victoria I know would love your feedback and NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center would love your feedback. So feel free while you're, while you're listening for the last you know, six or seven minutes that we have here together to fill out that survey, give us your feedback. We would love to hear from you. Victoria, we have a question here. How to build, how would I build a female network or a woman network in a competitive entrepreneurial environment? What are your suggestions or steps to take to actually build up a network of support? Well, I don't know that I built a network of support just from women, as I mentioned, largely who's been supportive of me, especially early on, were men. Um, this is probably not PC to say, but I would encourage people to build a network of both. This concept of just women, I think is, is troublesome. Um, there are a lot of women networks out there. So I think if you just Googled some of them, that would be easy. Uh, but I don't think Big Think would be where, I know Big Think wouldn't be where it is today if I didn't network with men. So that is not something that I'm expert in. And I would in some ways discourage that type of thinking, which probably women's networks will not like to hear from me. Though goes back to our very first question, what are something controversial that you believe that others may not agree with you on? So I actually think honoring that opinion is really important, Victoria. There's a lot of lessons learned there. We have a very tactical question. How might you effectively as a founder, or how did you in the early stages alpha and beta tests, or what did your testing look like? And how did you actually do that in correspondence with your funders? Did you let them know that you were doing this? Um, and how did you actually report back when something was or was not successful? Well, in the early days, we didn't even have a website. So we had to start from scratch building the website, but then also building the product and the product was content. So there wasn't a lot of beta testing. It was we are launching in January of 2008 and we need to get as much content as we can before that date. So we, it was a different type of product. So there was no data beta testing early on as time went on, there was, and you know, the investors are there to support you, but I don't think they're there to be involved in the day to day business. So we might have told them after we beta tested something, but they certainly weren't involved in, in the process of that. So I don't know if that answered your question, but. Absolutely, it's your experience. We're happy to hear it. Uh, we have another question, let's see, from Anna. What classes or workshops do you recommend for early entrepreneurs to take? Considering there are so many different online options, are there sp spaces right now that you learn from that are really interesting that you might want to share with this community? Well, what I would share with 
aspiring entrepreneurs. And this is probably something that is not particularly wonderful to hear. I think people need to understand cash flow and they need to understand accounting. Um, even just the basics. Had I not had the basics of accounting and understanding of cash flow, we probably would have burned through our money. And I think what a lot of entrepreneurs starting businesses don't understand is that even if you make sales, if cash isn't coming in the door, you can still go out of business. A lot of small businesses go out of business even when they have clients because they aren't managing their cash flow. So I would say a basics course in accounting would be really fundamental to people who don't have that background and who aspire to start a business. Because if you don't have money, you don't have a business. Very well said and very true. You know, <laughs> Victoria, thank you. I think this is a great final question from the audience before we wrap up with some words of wisdom for you to share. The question is, how did you achieve your initial traction and our critical mass? And was it simply organic because of intrinsic value or did you have to seed through some specific marketing tactics and activities? You know, we were in the pretty early days of, of content on the internet. So that was lucky for us. Starting an internet or media company today, I think is a whole heck of a lot more difficult because getting eyeballs, there are so many things people can be looking at, but the tr it remains true that no matter what, what you create in terms of um, a media, a media concept, it's the product and the content. So differentiating that is critical and that's what we did. We had the world's top experts and so that was the appeal. Nothing in particular that Peter or I or Big Think was doing except creating exceptional content. And I do think even in today's market, if you do that or one does that, there is room um, for you. And Victoria, I think our final question for today, what is the most important thing you hope founders will take away from your incredible book? Oh my gosh. Um, I think that, that A, it's possible. B, it's fun, and C, that there will be tons of challenges along the way and not to be discouraged by them. And one of our investors who was the founder of Tom Scott, he and I were talking last week and he gave me an incredible line, which I will share with everybody, which is the best, the worst thing that happened to me is the best thing that happened to me. And I think that in the moment, that's really difficult to believe. But for me, certainly along the way with Big Think, I would say that the biggest mistakes I've made and the worst things that have happened have proven to be the thing that I've learned the most from and that has advanced the business best. Thank you, Victoria. The worst thing that happened to me is the best thing that happened to me. Beautiful advice and parting words. Thank you so much. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak to this community, for sharing your insights that are in your book and to set such a great, great overview. On behalf of NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and everyone in attendance today, we sincerely thank you for joining us, Victoria. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And again, we would love to hear from you. Please take a few moments to fill out the survey that ISIS has graciously put into the chat. Both Victoria and NASIC Entrepreneurial Center would love to know what additional topics you would like to hear about and who you would like to hear from. Perhaps we'd like to have Victoria back on the platform. Of course we would. Please let us know. She has such amazing wisdom and insights that she shared. And for those of you that are still with us here, we would love for you to join us next Thursday, or I'm sorry, this Thursday for a step-by-step -step workshop on contact marketing. And next Tuesday, finding customers through social media for startups. So for all of you still in attendance, again, we're so grateful for your time with us today. We look forward to having you join us again. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.